The New York Times, a former newspaper, has hired a Hitler-loving journalist to cover the Hamas-Israel war while loving Hitler. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, Clavin, you ancient yet smolderingly sensual icon of American political thought. However, could your imagination fly so free as to create the ridiculous idea that a former newspaper as formerly respected as the New York Times, a newspaper that obsessively hates Donald Trump because he's literally Hitler, would hire a journalist who literally sings the praises of Adolf Hitler, who's literally Hitler because he's Hitler. <laughs> All right. Maybe not all of you find me smolderingly sensual, but ah, if only you had known me in my prime. Anyway, the point is, no, I am not making this up. The actual real-life New York Times, which you younger folks will have to take my word for it, actually used to be a newspaper, actually hired freelance videographer Solomon Hiji to cover the Hamas-Israel war, even knowing that Hiji once posted how great you are, Hitler, on Facebook and shared a photo of himself with the caption, I'm in a state of harmony as Hitler was during the Holocaust, unquote. Now, just for a bit of historical context, as some of you might know, Israel is a country full of Jews. And Hitler, for all of his otherwise delightful qualities, was not always as fond of Jews as he sometimes pretended to be. However, Times editor-in-chief Blithering Prevarication III defended hiring the Hitler-loving Hiji to cover Israel in a statement saying, quote, and my hand to God, this is a real quote. We reviewed problematic social media posts by Mr. Hiji when they first came to light in 2022 and took a variety of actions to ensure he understood our concerns and could adhere to our standards. Unfreaking quote. The Times did not explain what this variety of actions might have been, but we can only assume it included a priest sprinkling Mr. Hiji with holy water while screaming, the power of Christ compels you, until Hiji's head spun around 360 degrees and he projectile vomited enormous quantities of sulfurous green slime, which the Times then ran as an editorial. The Times statement continued, quote, while we understand some readers might feel that hiring a man who is in Holocaust harmony with Hitler to cover Israel or to cover anything that exists within a framework of a moral universe might make us New York Times senior editors appear to be hellborn, subhuman crap creatures squeezed out of the flaming red tuchus of a demonic yak-like beast so that our own mothers curse the day they gave us life and our children wander the earth like Cain, seeking to escape the shame of being in any way related to the flaming subhuman crap creatures who make up the senior editorship of the New York Times, we are nonetheless committed to maintaining the highest journalistic standards possible for those who are in harmony with Hitler and the Holocaust. Unquote. In related news, Gallup's annual poll on trust in the media was released this week. The poll found that a record 39% of Americans have no trust in the media whatsoever, and another 29% have very little trust in the media. Among Democrats, however, 58% do trust the media and also believe that men can turn into women and that if you look in the mirror and say Candyman five times, a monster will appear and give you COVID unless you're wearing a paper mask behind which you're helping to stop climate change by eating bugs. 7% of Americans trust the media completely. At least that's what we think they said, though they could only produce unintelligible grunting sounds because they were too stupid to form actual words. On a more positive note, a full 98% of those who are in harmony with the Holocaust and Hitler trust the New York Times coverage of the Israel-Hamas war, though 2% think the Times is too tough on Hamas because 2% are subhuman crap creatures who teach at Harvard University but I repeat myself. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. All right, so what's your guess? Does the House of Love and Death get a good review in the New York Times or not? We, <laughs> we're back laughing our way through, crying our way through, laughing our way through the wall of the Republic. I gotta add, I have to add to that satire, by the way. There was a an article in Vanity Fair, I think it was, that ran a kind of behind-the-scenes story of the New York Times running that bogus report that Israel had bombed the hospital in Gaza and that the younger reporters were going, shouldn't we maybe 
dial this back a little bit since it's coming from Hamas. And the senior editors were going, no, make it stronger. So this is completely in keeping with New York Times historical coverage, like in the 1920s when they reported that Hitler literally Hitler, was credibly credited with being actuated by lofty, unselfish patriotism. And, uh, of course, Walter Duranti, who hid the starvation murder of millions of Ukrainians because he believed in communism and felt you have to, if you want to make an omelet, you have to break a couple of eggs. Uh, So the New York Times, up to its usual business. This is a good time, an excellent time, the perfect time, actually. This is the perfect time to pre-order The House of Love and Death, the third book in the Cameron Winter series, and according to Publisher Weekly's Publishers Weekly starred review, the best in the series. You don't have to start with the beginning one. I would love it if you would pre-order this. Help us to get it on the Times list, or not the Times list, obviously, but, but some list that's being more honest. Uh, I, you can order signed copies at the Mysterious Bookshop, if you like, in New York. You just go on their website, Mysterious Bookshop. And if you happen to be in New York City on November 6th at 6 p.m., you can come and see me in person at the bookstore, Mysterious Bookshop, which is in downtown Manhattan on Warren Street. Also, you should subscribe to the Andrew Claven channel on YouTube, my personal YouTube channel. This, uh, we post The interviews are posted on anywhere you get your podcast, but we post them there as well if you want to watch the interviews. We had an interview with the border expert Lori Reese uh, last week, and this week, coming week, we will interview my little sister, Caitlin Flanagan of The Atlantic on heroic masculinity. And, uh, you know, we get, put all kinds of, we put a lot of good stuff, a lot of reaction stuff. Some We'll do some video games, exclusive content, and we'll send it to your house disguised as Mein Kampf so the New York Times won't disapprove. Uh, also, if you leave, <laughs> leave a comment there and your comment is as disreputable and disgusting and the new, as the New York Times coverage of the Israel Hamas war, we'll read it right here because we can be just as, you know, disgusting as the New York Times. Today's comment is from Kara Vaughn, 784, saying, sincere question in response to your comment, how is sin different from crime. Oh, yes, I said that I didn't judge people's sins, though, of course, you have to judge their crimes. Well, it's easy. I mean, you know, lots of things are a sin that aren't a crime. Pride is a sin, but it's not a crime. Lust is a sin, but it's not a crime. Coveting is a sin. Adultery can be, uh, is not really a crime anymore, but it's certainly definitely a sin. All kinds of things are sins that aren't crime, and I think you should avoid a sin incredibly, but I don't judge other people's sins because I'm too busy with my own. But you can judge, obviously. You can say, no, I'm going to stop you from attacking that person or whatever. All right, let's get today to today's episode, Jackasses, Johnson, Jenna, and the Jews. And we will also get to jack-o'-lanterns. All right, let's start with chapter one, A Tar Pit of Lies. So I had this conversation with the lovely and talented Megan Basham this week. And yes, I know you're gonna, what you're going to ask immediately is, will she come back on the show? And she will. She's had her own project that she's been dealing with. Uh, but she's writing a piece for The Daily Wire about the house of love and death. And she asked me a question in, in a way that I don't think I've ever been asked quite that way before. She asked me, she said, since you are primarily a crime novelist, and since this is what you've kind of dedicated your life to, are you sorry that your political speech has deprived you of a large segment of the reading audience and the kind of reviews that you could get from establishment papers, which they can't get from the right because we don't have the infrastructure to deal with the arts? Now, whenever I talk about things like being thrown out of Hollywood or never getting any jobs in Hollywood, not getting reviews and all this stuff, I I always say the the thing that the line that always comes out of my mouth is I've never I never lost any sleep over it. I've saved I've said that a lot. And I realized as I was talking to Megan that that's true because I don't sleep very much anyway, so I can't lose that much sleep. And also because I knew that I couldn't really do anything else being who I was. You know, I started to talk about politics in Hollywood and my phone uh, dried up and my income disappeared. I had to sell my house, you know, and all. but I, I thought like, this is who I am. This is what I do. And, and there was also a, a day about 15 years ago when I walked into a bathroom. This is absolutely true. I looked in the mirror and I said, if you keep this up, 
you're never going to win another literary award. And I'd won some major ones at that point. I said, you're never going to win another literary award. You're never going to get a review in the New York Times, those career-making views that only, reviews that only the New York Times can, and you're never going to be recognized. I mean, you know, Stephen King, there's always this quote they're using on the back of these books. Stephen King uh, said that I was the most original, that's the most original American novelist of crime and suspense since Cornell Woolrich, who was the great master back in the 40s and 50s. So basically saying I'm the most original author of crime and suspense in my generation, which I'm sorry, is true. I know it's not modest to say so, but it happens to be the truth. I am the most original uh, novelist of crime and suspense. And I knew that, that I would never be found to be that because the people who would had the power to say it were never going to say it. And so Megan asked me, was I sorry? Did I regret it? And I said, yes, of course I regret it. It's been immensely painful. It is, you know, it, it, these, these are the things that writers dream about. You don't go become a writer for money. You become a writer for the recognition, and so people will love you, and the artists and the audience will love it, and all this stuff. And all those things I knew I was throwing away at the time, and I put them away, and it makes me very sad. I've never lost any sleep about it because I do the same thing over again, but it hurts to give up your dreams. It hurts to uh, sacrifice even uh, large portions of your income. It hurts to see your wife uh, have to sell a house that she loves and all those things. Now, I tell you this because my friend, Jenna Ellis, who was one of the people indicted in the, this bogus Trump RICO case in Georgia, accepted a plea deal this week to keep herself out of prison. This is something called, it's very hard to understand, this is for first offenders in Georgia can get what is sometimes called deferred adjudic adjudication. And it means that you plead guilty, but you're not convicted of anything. You're not officially convicted. And if Jenna goes for three years without violating the terms of the deal, she'll never be convicted of anything. So she'll have no record or anything like this, which is as opposed to being sent to prison, which was what they were trying to do to her. And she'll probably have to be paraded through Trump's show trial and testify against him in a very unpleasant way, a way that I'm sure she's not going to feel very good about. And I'm sure, well, you can see from this little clip where she had to make this statement in court, she obviously doesn't feel great about having to do this. Cut one. I endeavored to represent my client to the best of my ability. I relied on others, including lawyers with many more years of experience than I, to provide me with true and reliable information especially since my role involved speaking to the media and to legislators in various states. What I did not do, but should have done, Your Honor, was to make sure that the facts the other lawyers alleged to be true were in fact true. In the frenetic pace of attempting to raise challenges to the election in several states, including Georgia, I failed to do my due diligence. So I'm not a lawyer, but this case seems destined to collapse on appeal. Uh, it's 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 absurd. The prosecutor, Fannie Willis, obviously a biased Democrat, is basically using the state's uh, RICO Act, the Racketeer, Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, and applying it to lawyers representing a client. So this means that if I, I'm a gangster, that's what this, these laws are made for. They're made to get gangsters who you can never get because they have ways of communicating and the feds can't figure it out. So they basically said if you arranged to commit crimes, all the people who arranged, who conspired to commit crimes, who were in this criminal conspiracy, could be indicted and tried and convicted as part of basically a criminal organization. But to say that a lawyer who says something, who who brings her client's dishonest plea before a court is conspiring and racketeering is garbage, right? I mean, Johnny Cochran would have to be a, a gangster convicted under RICO for saying that OJ was innocent when he knew, when everybody knew the guy was guilty. This is people deserve representation. Donald Trump deserved rep representation. And Jenna gave him that representation and now is being forced to plead guilty to something for doing that, and it's absurd. So it, I'm almost sure, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm almost sure this will be overturned on appeal. But having said that, I would bet cash money, I would bet cash money, and I'm not a betting man, that Trump will be convicted and that Jenna would have been convicted and sent to prison. And I believe Trump will, will do time for this because, first of all, the jury pool in this area is 75% Democrat. So that's who the jury is going to be. The jury is going to be a bunch of Democrats out for blood, out to get Trump. But also juries don't really decide these questions, right? They don't really decide, well, you know, it's not fair to apply the RICO Act to lawyers. That's something that judges do on appeal. So Jenna is a young attorney, no connections. She finds herself representing the president of the United States, who among us would turn down that job. She finds herself facing a massively 
powerful corrupt entity, which is the Department of Justice of the state of Georgia. This is a corrupt entity coming after her because they're coming after Donald Trump and she's in the way. And that's on one side of her. And on the other side of her is Trump, who has no, you know, even if you love Trump, even if you're MAGA, you know, Trump has no loyalty to anyone whatsoever. It's not that he's not nice to many people. It's that he does not care if you turn, you know, when Bibi Netanyahu called Joe Biden and congratulated him, that was it for Trump. Trump said, F BB, forget him. And, and he hated him. Now, this news came out and I'm watching it on social media. And as I say, Jen is a friend, so it's personal, but people start screaming at her. You know, they start screaming, oh, I wouldn't have done this. I, this is, you've got to stand, you're a coward, you're all this stuff. They, they claim because she raised, she fundraised $200,000 to pay for her legal fees. They say, oh, she just stole the money. She never saw that money. Went right to her lawyers completely. Anyone who knows anything about this stuff knows that money was gone in about 20 minutes. She's never seen it. She's never touched it. It has nothing to do with her. Her lawyers say this. Now, the reason I brought up this first thing about the small, I, I know the sacrifices I made are not, you know, I'm not, didn't parachute into enemy lines, but there were things that I cared about. I gave up some major dreams, major ambitions in my life, some major coin to say the things that I thought were true and to stand up for my country when my country was under fire. And these are things that you do if you want to be a man of integrity. I think a lot of people do them. I'm not, you know, not saying I'm, oh my gosh, I'm like a sterling individual. I'm just saying I have that behind me. I can tell you, I have no idea what I would have done in Jenna's situation. I'm sure she feels bad about it. Both, both ideas, going to prison and taking this plea and having to stand up and maybe testify against Trump, both of those things are not good things, right? That's a rock and a hard place. But I have no idea what I would have done. And I was kind of appalled, not surprised, not surprised at all, but I was appalled at the viciousness of conservatives on whose side she is attacking her, saying, oh, I would, I would have gone to the wall. I would have done this and I would have done that. And I'm just saying, as a man who has done a little bit of this and that, I, I have no idea what I would have done in that situation. Who would she be going to prison for, Trump? I mean, Trump's not going to go to prison for her. If Trump could throw her under the bus to get out of prison, he would. Why would she do that? I can see principles that she might have thought, I'll, I'll stand up for this. But how can you say, you know, Michael Flynn, an, an Army lieutenant general, who once defied orders in order to jump off a 45 cliff, 40 foot cliff, into the ocean and rescue two soldiers who were drowning off, off the coast of Granada, pled guilty to a totally bogus charge of lying to the FBI to protect himself and his family. You have no idea the kind of power you're up against when you're up against the law and when the law is corrupt, as I believe it is in this case. And if you think you're tougher than Flynn, if you think you're stronger, more heroic, more of a martyr than Jenna, I think you're living in a fantasy world. I think you are living online, basically, in your own mind and have no idea. I mean, even if you've done courageous things before, you don't know if you'll do courageous things the next time. You know, it's, it, you just don't know in any given moment what the situation will be, what the odds will be, what the uh, cost will be, and to whom that cost, uh, who will have to pay that cost. So this is my central point today. This is what I want to talk about today. The human mind has been accessible to deception since the Garden of Eden. There is something in the human mind that will deceive itself if it's not already deceived. That it will take little statues for gods. It'll take money for important, you know, things. It'll take applause for love. It'll all, make all kinds of mistakes. And the human mind is a self-deceiving machine. And right now, with the internet so ubiquitous, so ever-present with ourselves spending so much time staring into a machine where the information is impossible to parse, we are all of us being sucked into this mega world tar pit of lies. And it is the genuine prime danger to our country. It's not Democrats. It's not this. It's not that. It is the lies that we are all living in, the, the absolute deception, the the atmosphere of deception and fantasy that surrounds us and that we're part of. Some of it is obvious. Take pornography, you know, that replaces the love of men and women, and it replaces that with shapes projected uh, from the imagination onto the screen. And I've heard guys say, no, I'd rather do this. It's safer. You don't have to deal with women. Women are greedy and all this stuff. And a lot of boys look at this stuff long enough, and they find they actually can have sex with genuine 
with a genuine human being because they are lost, immersed, sunk into that tar of deception that is pornography. Transgenderism, another example. I mean, on the surface, if you think about it, there's no reason boys dressing up as girls should necessarily lead to oppression and violence, but it does because to live in lies definitely will make you oppressed and will make you violent. You know, the, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has now imposed a transgender pronoun mandate on its employees. So there's a guidance instruction employees that to, you must affirm any co-worker's self-proclaimed gender identity and preferred pronouns. That means the government is forcing you to lie. This is how Jordan Peterson got into all this trouble because he refused to do it. The government is forcing you to tell the lie that men can become women. Scientific American, which used to be a highly respected magazine, now defines gender as how an individual identifies woman, man, non-binary, and so forth. In other words, that, that's the defini- that is the definition of mental illness. I mean, he, how a man identifies as a giraffe, a polar bear, is he an ant? You know, he can be whatever he identifies as. That, that's, that is a, a completely non-scientific category. But the people at YouTube have decided to demonetize and censor and, and suppress anybody who says a man can't become a woman. Why? Have they ever asked themselves why some academic who's unhappy being a lesbian says, well, there's no such thing as gender so so that everybody is unhappy? And that becomes what? How How is that proof? How is that science? Why would you turn yourself into a censor? Censors always in the long run are the bad guys. Always, always. So you know that the people at YouTube who think right now that they're the virtuous one are historically going to be the people we laugh at and mock and say, look how they got fooled by this. What on earth would make you think that because a professor has an idea that men can become women, that that's a fact, that that's a fact worth censoring your fellow Americans over when a country that has a First Amendment. Why would you do that? It's because you are sunk in this tar pit of fantasy. This week, there was this terrible, terrible shooting, uh, this mass shooting in Maine. And these things are always just absolutely heartbreaking. As many people were murdered in an evening as are usually murdered in Maine, a beautiful state, beautiful, empty state full of woods, uh, usually murdered in Maine in a year. So as many people were killed in an evening as are often murdered in Maine in a year. The shooter was, is said to have been hospitalized and treated for mental illness. He's heard voices and all these things. And whenever there's a shooting, it is politicized immediately. The left especially loves to say, oh, we've got to get rid of guns. They, they want that Second Amendment because they want to be able, they're tyrants. They want to be able to tyrannize you. They don't want you to be able to fight back. They want you a, a, a populace that's unarmed. But the other thing about it is that that we all do this a little bit, is that we jump on whatever the ideas of this person was, and, and we demonize the ideas through the act. So in other words, if there's some, there some ideologies that are inherently violent, like Islamofascism is an inherently violent idea, all kinds of uh, racial bigotry, I think there's inherent violence in that. But, you know, people go in and a guy will be a conservative and immediately the press will say, ah, you know, are, are you will, ready to apologize? As a conservative, will you apologize for the shooting? Will you admit now that, you know, that's a violent ideology? Whereas, of course, if it's a transgender person who goes into a Nashville uh, Christian school and kills people, we can never hear the manifesto of that person because that, that would not be correct. The thing is, unless they have a, a, an inherently violent ideology like Islamofascism, people do this because they are mentally ill. And we, as so many people say, well, the police had all this warning. Why didn't they do anything? They didn't do anything because the laws aren't there for them to do it. And there's nowhere to put mentally ill people because all the institutions have been closed. Why were all the institutions closed? They were closed, first of all, because of a, a theory from Michel Foucault and others that mental illness, madness, was not a real thing. It was just a social construct, just a social construct where, by which the powerful excluded certain views, like uh, there's a dragon in the room, from other views, like there's a table in the room. So this, you know, it's just a social construct. There's no such thing as madness. And on top of that, they said, well, we have this theory where we can take them out of these institutions, some of which were pretty bad, and we can put them in local homes and halfway houses, and they'll be taking care of that. But those never manifested themselves because people didn't want mental institution homes in their neighborhood. Of course they didn't. Why would they? They worked so hard to get their homes, to have their property, to have their property be worth something. And people would say, NIMBY, not in my backyard. You bet not in my backyard. There should be an institution where we put these people and now, so many years later, these people can be treated with drugs and should be forced to take those drugs because they cannot take care of themselves. There's no system there because there was a fantasy, because people had a fantasy that, they, that madness was not a real thing. They had a fantasy that they could build halfway houses in neighborhoods and somehow you know, happily take care of mentally ill people. 
And now they have a fantasy that it would be somehow stigmatizing to treat people who are potentially violently ill because they are living in a fantasy world. Fantasy down the line, fantasy that has disrupted our sexual lives and told us that men are not men and women are not women, fantasies that have caused violence by letting mentally ill people out, fantasies that have caused oppression by telling us that men can turn into women. These are all lies. They are all lies, and yet we're immersed in them and so immersed in them that people who are weak, which is virtually everybody, get can no longer see think to themselves, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, why would I believe that? They do it on the right, too. You see people just immediately buying into any conspiracy theory that comes down the pike. Foreign Policy Review is a very um, prestigious journal where, you know, people in government write about their foreign policy views. Joe Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, wrote a piece for uh, the, this is the journal uh, Foreign Affairs, I'm sorry, that's the name of the journal, Foreign Affairs, just before the October 7th atrocities by Hamas, right? By these Hamas monsters who did things that are absolutely untenable. This is what the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said about the situation in Israel. The Israeli-Palestinian situation is tense, particularly in the West Bank, but in the face of serious frictions, we have de-escalated crises in Gaza and restored direct diplomacy between the parties after years of its absence, namely Trump. The region is quieter than it has been for decades. The progress is fragile, to be sure, but it is also not an accident. Biden's approach returns discipline to U.S. policy. Well, guess what? He was living in a fantasy, too, and now he's rewriting the piece online, but the dead tree stuff, that doesn't go away. So we are stuck learning that these people were living in a fantasy. I've never talked to somebody who worked in the State Department. They're some of the smartest and well, most well-educated men I've ever met. I've never talked to someone in the State Department who wasn't living in a fantasy world, who did not know the way the world works. And anybody, any guy, any Joe, every average Joe raking his lawn on a Saturday, going to work nine to five on a Monday through Friday, knows more about how the life works than the people in the State Department. They're living in a fantasy. And then there's this equity and colonization lie, this decolonization lie, this idea that somehow we can fix the past, that somehow we can make all people have equal outcomes, and if they don't, it's because you were mean to them. These these are fantasies that are, that they turn hatred and violence into nobility. They tell you that you're a noble person for hating people and for doing violence against people and for being prejudiced against people and for excluding people because you think they excluded others because otherwise, why wouldn't we all be equal? There's never been an equal outcome between two groups of people anywhere on the planet ever that was not an oppression. There's not an act of oppression. Never has that happened. No groups of people are equal in any way, shape, or form. Just does not happen. So these at Cooper Union, these demented students are chased... Uh, so, basically pinned some Jewish students inside the library. They had to lock the door. They were terrified. Just so, Here's just a quick clip of it. <laughs> Cooper Union, this is in New York City. These Jewish kids are stuck in there with their fellow students banging on the door, terrorizing. I've been in that situation. It's not a lot of fun, and they think they're doing the right thing. The people chanting about, you know, from the Jordan to the sea, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, meaning we're going to kill six million Jews again. You know, these people think they are doing right because they have this, this an academic theory that people can be decolonized, that people, that the imagination can be decolonized, that all the effects of the past can be moved away, that people can be equal, that the people of Africa can be made equal with the people of Europe. I'm sorry, but that's not the way life works. It is a total fantasy. And the idea that a vampire, evil person like Rashida Tlaib can be in Congress and not be censured and not be kicked out for the things that she says, the blood dripping things that come out of her mouth, it all begins with this fantasy and the essential woke fantasy, which is virtue. The fantasy that all of moral life before this moment was a big mistake by bad guys, but now the good guys are here and we're all going to do the right thing. Cruelty to people like my friend Jenna, from from conservatives, her fellow conservatives, people she's represented, people she's spoken to. She's come on the show half a dozen times. She has always been incredibly honest, even when people were screaming, oh, Trump is going to come back and Biden's going to be taken out of office. And Trump was telling people that and people were believing it. She came on the show and said, look, that's just never going to happen. 
All of this stuff, sexual confusion and unhappiness, murder by the mentally ill who need to be forced into care, violence in the Middle East, and mindless support of that violence on college campuses by children who, you know, that line from Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, they jest at scars who never felt a wound. They do not know what it's like to have the demons from Hamas descend on their, you know, free lives and tear them to pieces. And they're, and they're celebrating this and cheering it on. The world is not going to be reinvented by the human imagination. The truth is not a social construct. Morality is not a social construct. The truth and morality are the rock-hard bedrock of freedom. They are the rock-hard basis of mental health, and they're the rock-hard core of human thriving and joy. The left has abandoned it. The right is basically getting lost in this online meta world that has nothing to do with reality. It is time for those of us who think and care to make a stand simply for the facts of life. Are you struggling to sleep at night? I myself have given up the struggle, but did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity? Just look at me. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health and performance. Having a consistent nighttime routine is non-negotiable. If you're struggling with sleep, you need to check out Beam. Beam is designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Beam's Dream Powder contains a powerful, all-natural blend of ingredients, including magnesium L-theanine. Beam sent some Dream Powder down to the studio for my team to try. They have not woken up since. I, I have a lot of terrible sleepers, but they're just out. They said Beam really does help them fall asleep and stay asleep. Unlike regular sleeping pills that will make you wake up feeling groggy, Beam helps you wake up ready to go. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. Today, my listeners can get a special discount on Beam's delicious Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar, now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa and chocolate peanut butter. Better sleep has never tasted better. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time at shopbeam.com slash Clavin. Be sure to use code Clavin at checkout. That's shop. B-E-A-M dot com slash Claven. Use code Claven for up to 40% off if, of course, you know how to spell Claven. But just so you know, it's K-L-A-V-A-N. K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no easy claims. Chapter 2, The Ballad of Leroy Jenkins. I don't know how many of you remember Leroy Jenkins. It's got to be like 15, almost 20 years ago. Hilarious app. One of the funniest memes I ever saw. A meme that made me laugh harder than almost any other meme. It was these kids playing World of Warcraft, I think it was, online. And there are these nerdy kids and they're making these, having this nerdy strategy session where they're deciding how they're going to attack this monster or whatever. And there's one character named Leroy Jenkins. And here's, here's just a, the last part of the clip. We're going to need divine intervention on our mages uh, so they can uh, AE uh, so we can, of course, get them down fast because we're bringing all these guys. I mean, we'll be in trouble if we don't take them down quick. Uh, I think it's a pretty good plan. We should be able to pull it off this time. Uh, what do you think, Abdul? Can you give me a number crunch real quick? Uh, yeah, give me a sec. I'm coming up with 32.33, uh, repeating, of course, percentage of survival. Well, that's a lot better than we usually do. Uh, all right, thumbs up. Ready, guys? Let's or? do this. Leroy! <laughs> oh my god, he just ran in. Save him! Oh gee, stick to the plane! Oh gee, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> stick to the plane, Joe. Stick to the plane. I uh, love it. <laughs> he just charged in. Leroy Jenkins! That... That was Matt Gates when he went after Kevin McCarthy, you know, and, and I hit him and I would hit him again. To, he was, Matt Gates went after Kevin McCarthy, who was doing a, an efficient, decent job as Speaker of the House, not as conservative as people would like, but also leading a very small majority in, against a very powerful, you know, president and Senate and all these things. And Gates got rid of him and they went into three weeks of chaos and they came out with this guy now, um, Mike Johnson of Louisiana. And here's the funny, and I will go back to Gates in a minute, but here, here's the funny thing. I started reading up on Mike Johnson because nobody knew who he was, right? He was in Louisiana. And I'm reading about him. I suddenly remembered I sat next to him at the first Trump prayer breakfast. I'm 98% positive it was him because I remember him really well. We had a long talk because he was a freshman 
congressman. He had just been elected. And I was like, yeah, you guys think you're actually going to accomplish anything? What do you think's going on? He was very earnest, very religious. It was a prayer breakfast, very conservative, certainly socially conservative, and, and also kind of into the, this is to me the most positive thing, the machinery of Congress and was working hard in committees, always setting up committees even before Trump had taken office to get things done. I don't think he knew what a buzzsaw he was going to run into. And so now we're going to have to see whether he can get things done. I don't know how much of a a financial conservative is, but he made a speech. He said, you know, we have to get the debt down. We have to get the deficit down. He sounded really serious about it. He sounded really serious about getting rid of those continuing resolutions where the Democrats just pile pork in the trillions into the things. He's going to be tested right away because all of this stuff Biden is answering for really is not, some of it is targeted for things, but a lot of it is just, you know, feed me, feed me, and don't make us cut anything. He's got to cut domestic spending for us to be able to do the stuff that we're going to be doing in Ukraine, which he doesn't support anymore. He supported it at first, but he doesn't support that anymore. And Israel, which he very strongly supports. Very, very uh, devout Christian and very openly Christian, which I really like about him. We'll see. And we'll see if he's got what it takes. Because remember, you can't just judge him, you know, you can't just judge him on his uh, conservatism because he's also got to be efficient and he's got to work with people. Remember, the House is filled with people who represent not millions of people, but hundreds of thousands of people. They come from little neighborhoods that have very similar beliefs a lot of times, and they have to represent the people in those neighborhoods because they go home and those people are right there in their office complaining. And so, the you know, the absolute genius of Nancy Pelosi is that she managed to talk Democrats into betraying their the people they represented and getting voted out of office in order to keep her agenda moving forward. And the reason she did that was she knew that after they got voted out of office, then the Republicans would be in charge for a while and then the Democrats would be come back, but the laws that they passed would still be there. So she didn't care about the individual congressmen and she somehow, I don't know whether she bullied them or blackmailed them or just convinced them, she kept them in line and the Republicans have not been able to do that. So we'll have to see whether Johnson can do that. We'll have to see whether he can make deals and work with the Democrats. We'll have to see whether he can raise money. That's the other thing he has to do. He has to raise money and pick candidates who can win in their districts, which he didn't do, which Kevin McCarthy didn't do very well in the last midterms, midterm elections because, you know, it doesn't help to send a MAGA candidate into a purple district. It just doesn't. And a lot of the people see that what I'm trying to get at here is you don't want to live according to your fantasies in politics. That's a really, really dangerous thing to do. So my feeling about Matt Gates was that he he acted Leroy Jenkins. He acted really recklessly. He had no plan. He didn't know how he was going to replace this guy. He didn't know how he was going to get a new guy in. But he seems to have won through. I'm going to just assume that this guy, Johnson, is going to do a great job. Let's just assume it, because why not? We, we, we should wait to be disappointed if we're disappointed. But let's assume he does a great job. My feeling is Gates is redeemed. Gates won. You know, he won. I, I raised my glass to him. I think if, if he got a better speaker or even as good a speaker in with a, a more conservative, uh, you know, background, then then I say, well, Gates took a big, big chance and he was reckless and he didn't plan it out well, but he won through and he thought maybe he thought he could win through and he was right. And I, my feeling is I take back everything I said, you know, he, he won. That's the same reason I keep hitting Trump on his whining about having lost the election because he lost. He kept saying, I'm going to be reinstated. He kept saying, you know, he said, don't vote for in Georgia so that we lost Georgia. You know, he lost. That, that if, on the same realistic terms, I'm now praising Matt Gates, even in his recklessness. Those are the realistic terms on which I am. I, I attacked Donald Trump for the way he behaved because he was sad, sad because he lost the election. And he may have lost the election Badly, it may be dishonestly, but he lost it all the same. And the way I can tell is he's not the president. Joe Biden is. That's how I can tell that he lost. That's a giveaway. So so the, the, this idea that fantasy and righteousness and purity can govern you in politics is another kind of lie that can damage us, especially when we're in the right, as conservatives are largely in the right. We really have to know what we're doing. The idea, for instance, that they've the House voted down Jim Jordan because of his politics, because he was too conservative. Johnson is a mentee of Jim Jordan. He calls Jim Jordan his mentor. He's He may be to the right socially from Jim Jordan. He is a very conservative guy. But the thing is, Jordan, who I like a lot, 
is a rebel. And he's a guy who gets in people's faces and these guys who held things up and people probably have a lot of grudges against him and they weren't going to vote for him. Whereas Mike Johnson is a very quiet man, stands in the background, doesn't get in your way. People liked him. Another reason I've hit Trump because he treats people badly. So much of this is about ide- uh, ideology to us, to the v- voters. But to them, it's about, I work with this guy. I hate him. I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't like his tie. I'm not going to vote for him. That's why Trump lost so many things. That's why Trump alienated so many of his people because he treats them badly. This is what I'm talking about. Understanding politics is understanding reality. It is understanding reality. And when I look at what's going on in um, in politics, I don't really know where we're going from here. If Trump goes to jail, if Trump, if my problem with Trump is that he doesn't uh, he doesn't hire good people, and the good people he hires, he alienates. How are we going to govern if he wins? And yet he's so far ahead, it's hard to imagine him losing. And he's also in control of the party because all the people are afraid of him because he has so many supporters. It's a really interesting time to wonder, speculate, what's going to happen next. But if you're sitting there thinking it's all going to be great because you love Trump and Trump is ahead in the primary polls, you're out of your mind. The chances of Trump winning are small. If he wins, the chances of his getting to govern are small. It might happen. It happened with Gates. Gates pulled it off, but Gates is a better strategist than Trump is. Still, still, it might happen, but you've got to decide what chance you're going to take, what you can win with that chance, and how much you can lose. And if we lose this moment, it's going to be bad because these Democrats are on the march and the far left is on the march. And we, we had better cling to reality and act realistically as we go forward. All right. Let us move on to chapter three, murder most imaginary. When running a business, your employees can create all kinds of interesting situations and problems. It's terrible. Just ask anybody here at the Daily Wire, somebody not showing up when they're supposed to, an employee filing a complaint about something for which you don't have a documented policy or procedure, all of that. It just happened in the last 10 minutes. And that's why you should talk to Bambi. Bambi gives you access to your own dedicated HR manager, starting at just $99 per month. This person is available to you by phone, email, real-time chat. They'll help you run employee onboarding terminations and performance reviews. With Bambi's HR Autopilot feature, you can automate important HR practices like setting policies, employee training, and feedback procedures. All of Bambi's HR managers are based in the U.S. and can support the nuances across all 50 states. HR managers can easily cost $80,000 per year, but Bambi starts at just $99 per month. Schedule a free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type Andrew Claven under podcast when you sign up. Spelled B-A-M-B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com and type in Andrew Claven. Claven. How do you spell Claven? You may be wondering. There are no E's in Claven. I just make it look easy. It's actually K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's in Claven. This, this atmosphere, this, what I'm calling this tar pit of lies, this tar pit of fantasy, is so destructive to our country, and it is just magnified a million times by the internet, by the ubiquity of the internet, which was magnified in turn by the COVID lockdowns when people were just in rooms by themselves living on these screens, living in their imaginations. This George Floyd thing now is coming, it's coming to light as one of the most ugly fantasies, one of the most destructive fantasies America has ever had, that the narrative is unraveling. I've been making jokes about it for a couple of months now, about the fact that he obviously died of a of a um, drug, a fentanyl overdose, although I'm not sure that's true anymore either, but I'll get into that in a second. But now there's testimony that's been released in a sexual harassment lawsuit. Tucker Carlson and a couple other people were talking about this. It's brought new light on the atmosphere of pressure that was brought to bear to get a murder conviction for the police officer, Derek Chauvin, who Neil knelt on George Floyd when Floyd resisted arrest. Uh, I'm reading a lot of this from Jack Cashel in The Spectator because he's been covering it. Uh, the depositions in this sexual harassment case were taken in uh, taken this summer in response to a lawsuit for, filed by Amy Sweezy, a former Hennepin County prosecutor, against her then boss, former county attorney Mike Freeman. Sweezy alleges that Freeman engaged in sex discrimination, professional retaliation. She says, I called Dr. Andrew Baker. He was the ME who did the autopsy on George Floyd. 
She says, I called him early that morning to tell him about the case and to ask him if he would perform the autopsy on Mr. Floyd. She testified to this under oath. He called me later in the day on that Tuesday, and he told me that there were no medical findings that showed any injury to the vital structures of Mr. Floyd's neck. There were no medical indications of asphyxia or strangulation. But by day two, Baker, the ME, started talking about the risks. He said to me, um, Sweezy, Amy Sweezy, Continued, he said to me, Amy, what happens when this actual evidence doesn't match up with the public narrative that everyone's already decided on? This is the kind of case that ends careers. And uh, the autopsy revealed no physical evidence that Chauvin's actions had killed Floyd, but pressure was brought to bear on the ME by a former DC ME and a black activist named George Mitchell, who went and said, look, you don't want to be the smartest man in the room and turn out to be wrong. And he ultimately coerced uh, uh, Baker into writing this kind of weird report, the cause of death, cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement subdual restraint and neck compression. So in other words, he kind of said, he didn't say that the neck compression did it. He said it complicated the arrest because he had this arrest. Now, to be fair to Baker, Baker told the truth about this under oath and under cross-examination during the trial. Here's cut seven where he's being cross-examined. In terms of the placement of Mr. Chauvin's knee, um, would that explain anatomically why Mr. Floyd, would that anatomically cut off Mr. Floyd's airway? In my opinion, it would not. But see, the thing is, even though they had this evidence, the jurors were so immersed in the fantasy of George Floyd's racist murder. And remember, Derek Chauvin, none of these cops who were convicted of this, there were four of them were sent to prison for this. None of them was ever charged with with racism. They were never charged with violating uh, Floyd's civil rights or being racist or doing a hate crime. Or, of, and they said, Keith Ellison, one of the most leftist leftists of the left, said there was just no evidence of that. So there, the whole narrative was wrong. But this jury decided, uh, here they are talking to the late Don Lemon, one of the jurors saying they decided, well, he didn't have to kill George Floyd. He just had to be mean and not help him. It was cut eight. I brought up to the fact that this is not what he did, but more or less what he didn't do. He did not provide life-saving measures for George Floyd when he knew that the guy was in pain or needed medical attention. Mm -hmm. Even the um, firefighter that was off said, check his pulse, check his pulse. Well, then they checked his pulse and they said, well, do you want to do anything? No, we're leaving him here. He had ample to roll him over and start CPR, and he didn't. He mm-hmm. didn't move one bit. <laughs> so essentially, they were going to enforce this narrative, and they put a man in prison for life. I mean, this is, they've ruined his life, and they, uh, who knows if he'll ever get this case overturned, but it's obvious that George Floyd was not murdered by the police. He was not murdered by racism. There's no evidence of systemic racism. That there's, Cashel quotes uh, an expert saying that he was actually um, he had he had resistance to drugs. He had taken so many drugs, but he also had a, a bad heart, and his heart was really in bad shape, and that's what killed him ultimately. But because of this, and because of the riots, and because of the narrative, and because of the fantasy, because of this tar pit of lies, which absolutely engulfed us because we were all locked away from one another, living on uh, online, basically, the murder rate spiked. Black Lives Matter The name is a fantasy itself. The name Black Lives Matter is a fantasy itself, not because all lives don't matter. All lives matter, of course. But but, but the idea that these Maoist, anti-Western, anti-American creeps believed that Black Lives Matter, they didn't. Murder skyrocketed after this. And, you know, there's a a professional law enforcement organization um, that has a magazine called Federal Sentencing Report. A reporter, and they say a close analysis of the emerging crime patterns suggests that American cities may be witnessing significant declines in some forms of policing, which in turn are producing homicide spikes. Now, some of these spikes are going down as people calm down and people realize they can't defund the police. But these are the kinds of things crime rates are increasing only for a few specific categories, namely homicides and shootings. These crime categories are particularly responsive to reductions in proactive pl- policing. So because naming a Maoist group black Black uh, Lives Matter was a fantasy in itself because George Floyd's murder turns out to have been a fantasy because the entire media participated in this fantasy. Black P- 
people died. Because who do you think gets murdered by the black people who are committing the crimes? This, this is it. This commitment, this basic commitment to facts, this basic commitment to truth, this basic suspicion of academic theories. If, if we do not come back to this, if we don't force or create a media, more important, if we don't create a media that is dedicated to this, uh, you know, we are, we're going to lose not just the country, but our souls. I mean, we have to pull ourselves out of this tar pit and act carefully in search of the truth. Our friends at GenuCell have launched a new product. It's called GenuCell 3, which works fast on your under-eye bags and puffiness. GenuCell 3 is smoother, more luxurious, and it uses advanced technology to deliver complex vitamins and minerals directly to your face for instant hydration. It's like Gatorade for your skin. My producer, Lisa, loves using the GenuCell under-eye cream. We have the new GenuCell 3 product on the way so she can add this to her skincare routine. This new GenuCell technology keeps your skin looking young and healthy for years to come. The GenuCell Fall Classics package also includes a jawline treatment for a firmer neck and jawline. It also includes GenuCell's anti-wrinkle moisturizer and deep Firming serum. Go to genucell.com slash Claven for extra discounts on this amazing fall package. Get your skin ready for the cold and dry weather. If you don't look and feel your absolute best, you'll get your money back. No questions asked. That's genucell.com slash Claven. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, sure, great. That sounds fantastic. But how? Oh, how? Please tell me how do you spell Claven? It's K L A V A N. Final chapter, Jews and jack-o'-lanterns. We've talked about Jenna and Johnson and the jackasses who lied about George Floyd, and now I want to talk about jack-o'-lanterns and Jews. My favorite book reviewer, probably anywhere, but certainly at the Wall Street Journal, is a guy named Barton Swaim. He's very sophisticated, literate, civilized, really like his writing, really smart guy. Today, he had a column in the Wall Street Journal. Their column is called Houses of Worship. It's where they talk about religion. Uh, and his was called Down with Halloween's Ironic Death Cult. Candy and costumes are fine, but the day, like the world, has become too ghoulish. Now, I really admire Barton for writing this because no one wants to be the scold from Perfect World, you know, that movie, that Kevin Costner movie. No one wants to be the scold who condemns children having fun dressing up as ghosts and Batman and whatever. Uh, but he's noticed something that I've noticed too. And so he took the hit and he went out and actually talked about it, which is that when I was a kid, you dressed up as Frankenstein, you went out, you got candy, it was fun, everybody laughed, and it was good time. It was a little spooky, but it was all pretty much uh, in good fun. By the time my kid brothers went out, I the violence had started in my very nice suburban neighborhood. I had to go out one Halloween and chase the bad guys off the street personally because they were the, like the greasers were coming out and hurting people and they were coming after my brothers and I had to go and chase them home uh, to, to keep them from, from hurting people. So this is what Barton Swain says, forgive my Puritan sensibility, but I find the whole spectacle of Halloween, ugly and offensive and vaguely sinister. What sort of holiday deliberately terrifies children with images of murder and ruin and treats torture and death as a joke? Not being a Marxist, I'm reluctant to engage in class analysis, but it's impossible not to notice that big Halloween is a bourgeois phenomenon. Maybe it's a matter of income, but I wonder if it's also an expression of religious indifference. Lower income homes are far likelier to be observant and religious people tend not to find amusement in images of hell, torment, and butchery. Halloween in its present iteration is the perfect holiday for secularized and affluent sophisticates. The supernatural isn't real. Evil isn't a lurking spiritual force, but the consequence of bad societal arrangements or an underfunded education system. Most of the people one knows have little chance of being killed at the hands of another, but wouldn't it be thrilling if we could pretend in a jolly sort of way that something or someone was out to kill us? This is the same impulse, I assume, that drives the teenagers of wealthy families to watch horror movies. Now, I have to say, you know, I like ghost stories. There's those little eerie stories, you know, where something kind of is at the corner of your eye, but you're not quite sure what it is. I have stopped watching horror stories, even ones that look interesting. I've just stopped watching horror movies. And for a very similar reason, you know, I, I don't like this guy Mike Flanagan very much. I don't mean to attack him personally, uh, but he, he made a film, Oculus, which I actually enjoyed. But he's been remaking some of my favorite uh, ghost stories, uh, like The um, the Turn of the Screw by Henry James and The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, he, he's been 
remaking those, and he makes them in such a way that he has little ghosty scenes, but he immediately follows them up with boo scares where something ugly jumps out at you, which is the cheapest thing you can do. And he's very, it can get gory, and I find it horrific. And I was watching one of his shows, Midnight Mass, when I just stopped. And the reason I stopped is because Mass, communion, is the way that I commune with God by eating the body and blood of Christ. And I thought, I can just tell this is going to have demonic inner imagery. Now, the way you commune with God through the Mass is through an organ of perception. It's not your eye. It's not your nose. It's not your ears. It involves your taste, taste but it actually is your imagination, which is a way of, of seeing things that are there but are not accessible to the other organs of, of uh, perception. The imagination is an organ of perception by which we see things like love and, and uh, spirituality and all kinds of things that, that are there but are not accessible to our sense of organs. Why would I want to pollute my imagination when it's trying to communicate with God? Why would I pollute it with images from a cheap Hollywood movie when I can watch something else? You know, I could just watch something else that's exciting. Nothing wrong with scary stories. Please don't believe that I'm being like, you know, picky about it. I'm just saying I take care of my imagination. I have to. It's, again, I love scary stories. I like suspense stories. I'll watch violence. I'll watch all kinds of things as long as they're giving me an experience of the world that is in keeping with my moral understanding of it. I don't want to see evil. I don't want to see people uh, glorying in violence. And that is kind of more and more what Hollywood has become. So the flip side the flip side of this tar pit of fantasy I'm talking about is that we pretend that things that aren't true are true, and we convince ourselves that the truest things of all aren't true at all. You know, that is that is the thing that I'm talking about. I've been talking for weeks since this horrible attack against the Jews in Israel. I've been talking about the fact that the, this hatred of the Jews is based on their relationship with God, which has become all of our relationships with God through Christianity. And I, I've said a million times, I know people don't always hear what you say, but I, I've said a million times that you don't have to believe in God to understand this is true. You simply have to believe that God is in the imagination. Now, I believe the imagination perceives something there, which is God, but still, you don't have to believe it. You just have to know that we have, we have a relationship with God, whether we like it or not. And the Jews, because of Christ, are central to that relationship for all of us, and that's why people hate them. And instead, what you've got is this utter denial. People, people editing Christ out of our lives, can't talk about him in school. When Mike Johnson said a prayer in the House of Representatives, the people went nuts online. Oh my God, it's Christofascism. They're all going to die. It's Christo, you know, it's their name, that's their name for Christianity, it's Christofascism. But, you know, no, there happens to be a God. Johnson happens to be right. You cannot have a moral government without a moral people. You can't have a moral people without a people who have a relationship with God. Every founder said that. Every founder said that the Constitution was for a moral people. And then you get exchanges like with Corinne Jean Identity Hire when she was asked about this hostility that we see everywhere toward Jews. Before we play her, just play this chant at NYU in New York. It's cut 10. <laughs> These spoiled little boys and girls are chanting, we don't want no two states, we want all of it, which means the murder of six million Jews. They are Nazis. They are repeating, calling for a repeat of the Holocaust in their privileged American lives because the violence is unreal to them and God is unreal to them. What's real to them is an academic theory. And here, Corinne Jean Identity Hire being asked about anti-Semitism. This level of concern right now about the potential rise of anti-Semitism in light of everything that's going on in Israel. So a couple of things. Um, look, um, uh, we have not seen uh, any credible uh, threats. I know there's been always questions about uh, credible threats. Uh, and so I uh, just want to make sure that that's out there. But look, uh, Muslim and those perceived uh, to be Muslim have endured a disproportionate uh, number of hate-fueled attacks. And certainly President Biden understands that many of our Muslim Arab, Arab Americans and Palestinian American loved ones and neighbors are worried about the hate being directed at their communities. She immediately goes back into the fantasy, back into the theory that Muslims are somehow higher up on this inter, uh, you know, this power scale that the left has invented, which itself is a fantasy. 
All of it is a fantasy. This is the thing that's crazy. We're not learning from the world. We're not even looking at the world. We're looking at our screens. We're not learning from the world and basing our ideas on the world. We're looking inside our brains at fantasies and basing our ideas on that. Without the truth, without the truth, you cannot be free. You cannot be sane. You cannot be happy. Everything now is conspiring to tell us lies. We have got to be the bulwark. Every one of us, we have to be. Even when we hear things that we love, even when we hear things from the right, we have got to be be the people to stand up for the truth because it's only in the truth that you can be free and live a life of greater abundance and greater joy. It is time for the final episode of Convicting a Murderer. Let me just say, if you're still not convinced that Stephen Avery is guilty, just wait. Candace finally brings an end to the nightmare, making a murderer created. They claim Stephen Avery was a victim of corrupt law enforcement. That's what they do. They demonize the police. But Candace is going to show you who the real villain is in this final episode. Even the most adamant Stephen Avery supporters will be able to see the truth. Take a look. Coming up on the finale of Convicting a Murderer. How were these filmmakers able to convince so many people that a man like Stephen Avery is innocent? The only story they wanted to tell was one of police corruption. They were committed to a story. He's doing a good job. She's doing a lot of investigation. They were looking into things for him. She's doing more than the public defender and my uh, investigator. They were Stephen Avery's PR team. They convinced millions of people that they were innocent. Emails show that they were providing plenty of direction, that the Averys were to look like a close-knit family. Manitowoc County officers were to look suspicious. I think I will forever be obsessed with the media's ability to turn a villain into a hero or a hero into the villain. If they could do it to me, they can do it to anybody else. Cool. Uh, You can binge all 10 episodes now, but only if you're a Daily Wire Plus member. So sign up today at dailywire.com slash subscribe to watch the entire series. Clavin Clapbacks. Woo! Leroy! That thing thing has never stopped cracking me up. I have to tell you just one thing. This is not a clapback, but just before, moments ago, I just received a letter uh, from an email from a lady who told me that she gave my book, uh, my memoir, The Great Good Thing, to Rush Limbaugh when he was dying, and Rush uh, found it um, incredibly comforting and said I was a genuine genius, which Rush actually told me to my face. But, But that uh, is so moving to me. I just had to share it with you I, that, that he found my work comforting. Uh, uh, means a lot to me. All right. Brian Not- Nottingham says, Lord of the Multiverse. Uh, you said on the show with Andrew Hyatt, my interview with Andrew Hyatt, the director, that you love the painting St. Joseph holding baby Jesus, but by any reason view, the painting isn't true. Just to remind you, if you didn't see that, you should watch it. It was a good interview. But uh, I showed it I showed this wonderful painting of an an elderly Joseph holding the baby Jesus to an evangelical friend, and he was insulted by it because it's a Catholic idea that Joseph was old because Mary was a perpetual virgin, so she married an old man, and that's why she was a perpetual virgin. And he is saying the painting's not true, so how can you enjoy it? Well, first of all, it's a true representative representation of the Catholic view of the marriage of Joseph and Mary. So you don't have to believe in the marriage of, uh, in that view in order to experience it through art. It can, that can only broaden your mind to, to experience it even, you know, then you're in the mind of a Catholic. You don't have to believe it. You, I, you know, I don't believe uh, everything I see at the movies, even if the movie pretends to be a true story, like if it's a movie about the Alamo in which everybody's a hero and J- Davy Crockett is John Wayne. I understand that Davy Crockett wasn't John Wayne, but I understand also that I'm seeing a vision of something, uh, of patriotism that is being communicated through this tr- quote-unquote true story. So you can believe what you can believe, but you can be open-hearted and open-minded enough to experience what somebody else believes. I think that's a beautiful thing, not a bad thing at all. Uh, Raphael Barnard, Bernard says, hello, Clavin, longtime fan. Your last few episodes finally moved me to read The Great Good Thing. Uh, what an inspiration. Uh, he says he went into therapy because he was inspired by the book. He says, but instead of being moved closer to God and theology, as you were, I find myself moving away, stuck in a black hole of grief and bitterness that no higher being protected me when I was a child. Your journey back to God and laughter included extended periods of such feelings, question mark. Uh, you know, well, I see it differently. I have to say I see it differently. God 
wants us to be free, and that is a big, big, big deal to him, and he allows tremendous evil to be committed by people uh, in the name of their freedom, And because without freedom, there's no love. You can't love by force. You have to love by freedom, and this causes this terrible thing. What, what God will do uh, is, is he will find good in the evil that's been done to you. He will move you to good. It will not get rid of the evil. It won't get rid of the pain. It won't get rid of the scars that you have from the evil because the things that happened to us in childhood linger with us in many, many different ways and the trauma you experience lingers with us. Um, but, but, you know, he will turn it to the good. And so much of the things that were done to me as a child that scarred me, that uh, hurt me, have been turned to the good by God, by following God. And so uh, you might try it, you know, to see if he's there. I, I'll tell you he is. And uh, it, it, you might find yourself being led to the good, even through your pain, even through your flaws. But he, he does not stop the evil from happening. That's, uh, you know, part of life. And, and you wouldn't Live, life wouldn't be life if that were true. Uh, from Megan, she says, I've been listening to you advertise your new book, and I finally gave in. I read a sample of the first two books in the Cameron Winter series, uh, When Christmas Comes, and A Strange Habit of Mind on Amazon Kindle. Bought them almost immediately uh, and, and pre-ordered the third one. I powered through both books in about three days, and I can't wait for the next one to come out. Thank you for everything you do. The Daily Wire has revived some of my hope that humanity is not completely lost. God bless you and the whole Daily Wire crew. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm really proud of the whole crew here, not my staff, obviously. They're, I, if you could see them, it's terrible. But, but everybody, all the work that's being done here really makes me proud to be a part of it, and I'm glad it is helping for you. And that is why you should become a member today by going to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code CLAVEN at checkout for two months free on all annual plans, and therefore you will not be plunged instantaneously into clavenlessness, which is just so much worse than clavenness. There's, the, the difference is, it's only a few letters, but the difference between clavenlessness and clavenness is huge. With clavenlessness, you're you know just in utter darkness each moment, feeling like eternity. With clavenness, if you subscribe, you get to go to the member block. That's where we're going now.